Baruch Hu, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Most respected Achen, beloved in the Lord, Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. It is a joy for me to be here tonight with you all uh, as we continue on with the voice in the wilderness. I just wanted to appreciate our beloved Emmanuel Achen and all his efforts towards this. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come speak. And um, kind of going off with what Achin was saying, you know, I thought as I was thinking of what to speak about today, I thought it was fitting to speak about the saints because we see um, in the season of the resurrection, even as we approach the Feast of Pentecost, uh, is where we see uh, the apostles go out. Uh, they go out and they have apostles and they have apostles, uh, so on and so forth, to the point where we have many saints in the life of the church. Um, and I think, you know, intercessions to the saints, it's something that we often hear about, we often uh, discuss, or we we say it in our prayers, we say it during Korbana, all these things. Uh, but we really, sometimes I feel that we're not too sure of what it means to uh, intercede or what it means uh, that we have uh, intercession to the saints, or even, you know, as we do it in the evening prayers in the Korban and the Kukulions to the saints. Um, and this is something that, you know, in the world that we live in, uh, where orthodoxy is a uh, well-kept secret, uh, oftentimes many people ask, you know, why do we worship saints? Why do we pray to saints? What is the need for this? So I'm, I hope, God willing, as we go through this, we kind of get a better understanding of why we do what we do and the importance of it. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, to get started, really, to understand what intercession to the saints means, why it's important, I think we have to set a foundation uh, to understand uh, more kind of like uh, the diving board for us to jump off of, to jump and dive into uh, this topic. So for setting the foundation, um, I'd like to talk about prayer, uh, prayer in general. I'm going to go back really quickly. Uh, prayer in general, something that, you know, we're, we're taught to do uh, at a young age. Uh, we pray all the time. We pray in our rooms. We pray at church. We pray with our family, so on and so forth. Uh, and so what is prayer? Uh, and I think oftentimes when we ask... Uh, what prayer is, we tend to think it's a communication with God, we speak to God, all those things, and all those things are, are correct. But there are two types of prayer that we have uh, that we don't go into detail. First, we have the private individual prayer. This is what our, our Lord tells us in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And this is where, you know, many of us may have a set place in our homes to pray. We may have a set place in our rooms, like a prayer corner. You know, this is just a picture of one uh, where we go to pray. And we often do this in, in a way where nobody else can see. And we say, you know, my prayer life with God is personal. It is personal between me and God, no one alone. And to an extent, yes. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that this idea of a just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, this personal relationship only, solely, is really, relatively speaking, a new phenomenon. Um, in the early church, that's not what we see. In the early church, the emphasis wasn't really on personal prayer. The emphasis was on communal prayer, bringing the community together. Um and this is just a clip you see um, of a Coptic Orthodox Kurvana, where you see the community is gathered. You see people of different uh, ages there. And we see that communal worship in the life of the church and the Orthodox church and the early church really uh, it was very important because simply in the fact that we are relational beings. I know who I am in relation to somebody else, right? Um, I know that I am a son in relationship to my parents. I know that I am a brother in relationship to my my sibling. 
Uh, and this goes on and on. I know I am a parishioner in a relationship to uh, my priest. All of us are meant for some sort of community. Uh, whether we're married or not, whether, when we're married, our community is our family, our wife, our husband, our children. Even in those who, for those who are not married, they have a community. The monastic community, uh, the monastery has a group of monks. Why? Because the emphasis is on the community. We work out our salvation in the community. Right? We see uh, the Greek word for the church, ecclesia, it simply just means it's a gathering. It's an assembly. We're all meant to come together. And this is very important for us to really understand why we seek the, the saints' intercession. We see in the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 16, from whom the whole body, all of us, were joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we see, uh, even in Ephesians, right, we're all members of one body. This is the importance. This is uh, the context that we look at, uh, that we have to have to understand why we Seek the saints' intercession. So I'm going to keep going. This is very clear even in our Holy Qurbana, in the uh, prayer follow, in the pre-sanctus prayer, right before, before we say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And there's a prayer that the priest says, and this is specifically from the anaphora of St. Cyril. He says, O you, O Lord, both heaven, which is your throne of your, which is the throne of your majesty and the earth, which is the footstool under your feet sing praise the earth glorifies your holy name in this church that chants the sound of glory to you for the mouth of her children by the secession of the prophets the company of the apostles the sufferings of the martyrs the orders of the confessors the theology of the doctors the orderly standing of the ascetics the endurance of the abstinence the hosts of the just the assemblies of the righteous and the faithful of all ages so we see in this specific prayer, the priest is explaining and saying that it is in this church, whatever parish we are in, in that church, with the apostles, with the prophets, with the martyrs, with all those of past, all those of the future, all those present, we are offering glory. So what does this mean? It means that the church... The body of Christ includes us, it includes those before us, and includes those after us. The church is a living, breathing organism. Uh, so this sets the foundation for us to really understand what intercession to the saints are. Uh, now we, the second part of the foundation, prayer versus worship. As I mentioned before, when we say, what is prayer? It's usually communicating with God. One-on-one, -on -one, me and God, nobody else, doesn't really matter. Uh, but what is worship? Uh, there's a very clear distinction between prayer and worship. And I think nowadays, uh, in the language that we use when we speak to our friends and uh, whatever we see online, these two words often get intertwined. We often think that prayer is worship. Sure, prayer is a part of worship, but prayer is not worship itself. Isn't prayer and worship the same, right? Uh, prayer properly, right? It, even in the Old English, we don't see it now, but in the Old English, it just means to exchange wishes. Uh, you, we may see it if you look in the, you know, the King James Version of the Scriptures. You know, oftentimes it's like, I prayed to thee, my Lord, uh, but it's not speaking to God. Or in like ancient English, it will say, if I'm at the dinner table, it will be like, I pray thee, please pass me the mashed potatoes. Um, it is a wish that is being exchanged. Now, worship, it means the service of God. Um, this Greek word, lateria, that same root is used for idolatry. And as we know, idolatry is the worship of other idols who is not God. So we see worship and prayer are different things. Prayer is a part of worship, but prayer is not necessarily in and of itself worship. Worship is service of God. Prayer is exchanging wishes. Prayer is asking. It's a communication back and forth. When I pray to God, I am asking for something. 
I am asking for forgiveness. I am asking for a healing, for help on this test, for, for my friends, whatever it is. So worship alone is for God. We don't worship saints. Make, well, let's make that very clear. We do not worship saints, but we seek their prayers. We seek this exchange between us so that they can have that exchange between them and God. And we'll get to, to that a little, little later. Now we ask, who is a saint? Right? We, we set the foundation. We set what the diving board for us to jump off of. And now we're going to get into what is a saint, who is a saint, why do we pray to saints, so on and so forth. Uh, who is a saint? A saint is an active member in the body of Christ. It is someone who makes God's goodness attractive. A saint is a real person, real people who lived real lives with real temptations. One who has been made what holy baptism declares them to be, set apart for God. If you have come face-to-face uh, -face with somebody who is very holy, and I, I'm sure many of us have come, I'm not necessarily speaking about uh, bishops, priests, but anybody, you know, even amongst lay people, when you, when you have a conversation with somebody who is just really radiating the goodness of God, uh, you can tell that they're, they're set apart. You can tell that they are different in a sense. Yes, they're different, but at the same time, they're a same person. Uh, they are a person who is real. They're a person who has a life, just like you and I. Uh, people who struggle with real temptations, just like you and I. I think you look at the lives of all the saints. No saint was made um, or was given the title of a saint without going through some temptation, without going through some hardship, just like you and I. Now we see... Uh, in the scriptures and in you know the Quran comes, we see there are two saints really, um, and it's a very minor distinction, right? A saint with a capital T and a saint with a lowercase t. Simply put, a saint with a capital T is somebody who is uh, officially canonized and recognized by the church. So we have Saint Mary, uh, Saint Gregorios, uh, Saint Stephen, Saint George, uh, and a lowercase s saint is everybody, the body of Christ, you and I. Um, so I want to focus on this part, right? Uh, set apart for God. In the Greek word, saint is agios, which means holy. When we think of uh, different things that is set apart for holiness, right? The altar. Um, you see the priest's vestments that is set apart for the use of the worship of God. And the worship towards God. In the same way, we who are beings are also called to be holy, right? We're called to be set apart. We're called to be sacred. Uh, we're called to be sanctified. We're called to be set apart for God. Um, so a saint is somebody who is holy, somebody who is set apart. Where do we see this in the scriptures? Um, specifically the lowercase s, right? Romans 1, 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And Ephesians 2, 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Beloved in the Lord, we see the church in Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus they're real people. St. Paul is writing to real, actual people who are alive at the time. So what, what can happen is if St. Paul was alive today, he could write to the church in Atlanta, called to be saints. To the church in Phoenix, called to be saints. You fill in the blank. Right? We're all called to be saints, to be set apart, to be holy. Now, we understand what a saint is. I hope we got we 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 got the gist of what a saint is, uh, different characteristics and qualities of a saint. Now, where do we see intercession in the scriptures? We're going to go through some Old Testament and New Testament portions to see intercession. Intercession itself is a request. Um, when I'm interceding for somebody, I am praying for that person. I'm helping that person. This is what we'll see in the scriptures. 
Exodus 22, 30 to 32. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. We see Moses praying for his people. His people messed up. His people created a golden calf. But he goes on behalf of the people. He goes directly to God and asks for their forgiveness. We see in the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 15, verses 12, verses 14. The vision he saw was this. Onias, who had been a great high, who had been a high priest, a true gentleman, a modest and noble manner, one well-spoken and from childhood formed in all that pertains to virtue, was praying with hands outstretched for the whole nation of the Jews. Then in the same manner, another man appeared, distinguished by his gray hair and glory, and having about him a certain astonishing and majestic preeminence. Onias then spoke, saying, This is Jeremiah, the prophet of God, a man who loves his brothers and prays fervently for the people and the holy city. So we see this high priest, Onias, he stretches out his hands and he prays for the whole nation of Jews. Whether he knows them or not, he prays for them. He is interceding to God on their behalf. We look in the book of Acts chapter 5 verses 14 to 16. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and all those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Uh, we can imagine what was happening in this scenario, right? We see that the apostles were out there healing people left and right, multitudes, men and women. So you can imagine, right? Maybe there is a paralytic man like we see in the Gospels. He can't walk. So what does he do? He asks them to bring him out to the streets. These people who are bringing the sick into the streets were doing an action. We're interceding for this person to become healed. Uh, even, you know, we look in the Gospels, the, the paralytic man, his friend interceded on his behalf by bringing him down so that the Lord may heal him. We see in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Who are the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God? They are the martyrs. They are those who have already passed, who have been given the crown of victory, the crown of glory, the saints. We see very clearly that they themselves are praying for those who are living, for those who are living we look in the book of revelation chapter 8 verses 3 that another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar he was given much incense that he should offer with prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne this is very clear uh, is very clearly seen in the holy Corvana. right this is the song that we sing this is the time of prayer and the time of forgiveness this is the time of mercy the time of supplication What's happening? Uh, we see the all the, the priest asks for the congregation to pray for him as he offers the sacrifice and he prays for those. But we see the person taking the censer, right? Whether it's the, the acolyte, the shamashin, they go down the all they go down the entire church. In one way, I know historically we all we we all know this that um they're taking out all those who are not orthodox, right? Uh, but we see in another sense, the person taking the censer is going all the way down to the end of the sanctuary and coming back up. And what does he do? He stands at the steps of the altar holding the, the censer like this, right? We see that he himself is gathering the prayers of those in the congregation 
and bringing them to the altar. So we see the angels, the saints, they're, this is where we see the intercession. They're offering the prayers on our behalf. So we see very clearly this is seen in the scriptures. Now let's look at what the early church did. Um, we as Orthodox, we pride ourselves in the fact that we haven't changed. Now our faith is the same. The things that we've practiced back in the first century is what we do now. So let's look at what the early church does. This is the martyrdom of Polycarp. St. Polycarp is a direct disciple of St. John the Evangelist, the beloved one of our Lord. So in, in the book of his martyrdom, it says, they took up his bones, which are more valuable than precious stones and finer than refined gold, and deposited them in a suitable place. There, when we gather together, as we are able, with joy and gladness, the Lord will permit us to celebrate the birthday of his martyrdom in commemoration of those who have already fought in the contest and also for the training and preparation of those who will do so in the future. We see the people of the time take the bones of St. Polycarp, right? What we see is it's finer than precious, uh, more valuable than precious stones, finer than refined gold. And they put them in a place. We can assume that they put it at an altar. And what do they do? Every year on the day of his martyrdom, they come and they commemorate all those who have passed away and all those who are preparing for martyrdom in the future. So we see they're using the intercession of St. Polycarp. They're seeking his intercession that the Lord may have mercy on those who have already passed and that the, the Lord may grant strength and mercy to those who are preparing for martyrdom in the future. We look at St. Clement of Alexandria. He says that the true Christian prays in the society of angels as being already of angelic rank, and he is never out of their holy keeping. And though he pray alone, he has the choir of the saints standing with him. If you guys have gone to uh, many Eastern Orthodox churches, you, you walk in there, and it's just breathtaking. It takes your breath away because you're surrounded by all of these saints, these icons of the saints. You have the icon of Christ directly above and all the saints around you. <clears throat> when we worship, this is what's happening. The saints are directly around us. The angels are with us. We are never alone. So I hope we, we've kind of understood where we get these from, where we get the intercession from. Uh, it is a practice of the early church. It's not something that's made up. It's it's practice of the early church. It comes directly from the scriptures. Now, I'd like to go, as I mentioned, uh, intercession of the saints is usually, if you speak to somebody who converts to orthodoxy, uh, this is one of the difficult things that takes some time to comprehend, right? Uh, and usually there's some frequently asked questions around this. So I want to go over those. So one of the questions are, are the saints dead? Why are we asking someone who is dead to pray for us? We have to ask, are the saints really dead? Because our Lord says that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So no, the saints are not dead. While their bodies may be buried, they themselves are not dead. They are all fully alive in Christ, just like you and I. We are alive in Christ. You see, the church itself, as I as I showed before, the church is a it, it includes us, those who have passed away, and those who are coming in the future. It is a living and breathing organism. For the church to be a living and breathing organism, this means that the saints have to be alive. The saints are alive in Christ. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. How do we know the saints are actually with us? Simply, the scriptures say. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, who are these witnesses? What are they witnessing? They're witnessing Christ. The martyrs, they're witnessing Christ. The saints are witnessing Christ. And we're surrounded by them. 
right? We see here in this icon, right? Presumably we can say it's all, you know, you have St. Mary, St. John, the angels. We can go ahead and probably assume that there's some saints mixed up in here. If they are at the throne of God in the kingdom, wouldn't they be at the throne of God on the earth? What is the throne of God? Is the holy altar. The saints and the angels surround this altar just as they do in the kingdom. Next question. Doesn't Paul say the only mediator is Jesus Christ? This is a common one. We see St. Paul says in his uh, epistle to Timothy chapter 2 verses 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. So if Christ is the mediator, why need anybody else? But we forget the first part of that chapter. I exert, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Even here we see intercessions. right? But what, what is a mediator? Somebody who mediates between differing parties. Our Lord mediates, Christ mediates the atonement of our sins and our redemption. Christ being the one who died for us. We have one mediator, but we have many, many intercessors. This is a hymn that we sing uh, every now and then uh, uh, during the Holy Kurvana, right? The resurrection of Christ grants atonement for our souls. Cry out in faith to the Son who redeemed us by his cross. Blessed be your salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see, if you look in the Kurvana Krama, in the parentheses, the resurrection can be changed to any other part of Christ's life, the incarnation, the crucifixion, whatever it is. Why? Because it is the through the incarnation our Lord mediates. He mediates between the atonement of our sins and our redemption. Yeah. Lastly, Oh, or no, not lost. Sorry. Uh, why can't I go straight to God? This is something that we hear often. Why can we not just go straight directly to God? We can. We can go directly to God. But we see asking the saints for prayer only helps us. It doesn't. It doesn't hurt us. It's like asking my whole family to pray for me. One, you know, I have four or five people praying for me. It's a very powerful prayer. We don't, ask, we don't have to ask the saints to pray for us. We have to change this mentality. Uh, it's not a must, but rather it is we're given this opportunity to ask the saints to pray for us. It's like, you know, let's say um, I get in trouble when I'm, when I'm at home, right? When I was younger, I got in trouble many times. And my parents wouldn't speak to me, right? Understandably slow. Uh, I probably made them very angry. So how would I get them to forgive me? Or how would I get them to kind of just uh, loosen up a little bit? I would tell my brother to go and speak to them and tell them to forgive me and to, to let, it, let it slide, right? Why? Because at that point in time, my parents are mad at me, not mad at him. So he goes and then he intercedes on my behalf. Right. Even when we look in the lives of the saints, St. Saint Paul himself, who is somebody who is very close to God, asks for prayer. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.19. And I confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Why wouldn't we ask somebody who is close to God to pray for us? Their prayers strengthen us. Even the saints ask for their prayers. We look at the life of St. Mary of Egypt. She was a holy person, somebody who was very close to God. But yet she still asked Zosima, the priest, to come and receive so that she can receive the Qurbana. She asked for help. And lastly, a question that comes up more often than not. Does God love the saints more than he loves us? God loves everyone equally. A relationship takes two people to make work. Right? We see in this picture right here, two hands together, right? Here's God, here's mankind, or you put your name in here. We have the opportunity to hold on, 
But we also have the opportunity to not hold on. The question we have to ask, I don't think is, I don't think we can ask, does God love the saints more than us? But rather we should ask, do the saints love God more than I do? God loves us equally, but it takes two people to have a relationship. When we ask God, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you listening to me? We really have to look deep down and ask, who moved? Was it God who moved? Or was it me who turned my back on God? So does God love the saints more than us? No, he loves us equally. But the saints, they chose to love God back. They choose to read, to, to immerse their lives in the scriptures, to immerse their lives in the prayers. They chose that themselves. We have the same opportunity as well. This is a quote by St. Nikolai. He says, a true friend prays to God for his friend. A true friend cares about the salvation of a friend's soul. To draw a friend back from false ways and set him on the true path, that is a precious friendship. The saints of God are a man's greatest friends. There's somebody who, there are individuals who pray for us. There are individuals who bring us closer to God by their prayers. This is why intercession of the saints are important. We surround ourselves with holy people, we become holy. Um, we start to feel, right, if we come close, when we go outside and it's sunny outside, because we're outside, we feel the warmth, we feel the heat. In the same way, when we surround ourselves with the saints, we feel God's love. We feel God's goodness. I want to end with this. This is a very beautiful picture um, of a parish in Dallas as an Antiochian Orthodox parish. And this was during COVID, where nobody could go to church. So what does the priest do? The priest takes all the icons of the saints off of the wall, and he puts it in the congregation to fill the congregation. This is what happens every Sunday, every prayer. This is a physical manifestation of what is happening spiritually. The saints are there with us. I end with this story of a priest. Um, this priest is somebody who, it was a Sunday morning and he didn't want to celebrate the Qurbana because it was super cold. It was uh, 10 degrees below, so negative 10 degrees. And the priest knew that nobody's going to come to church. The only person that's going to come to church is the chanter, the person who's helping lead the prayers. And so he just forces himself to go. And he goes and he does the preparatory service, the tuyobo, the chanters chanting the hymns in preparation. And he begins the Holy Kurvana. And as he begins the Holy Kurvana, he sees people arriving at the church. He sees bishops, priests, monks, nuns, and some, some of the laity who were there. A lot of them sat, in, what he could see is that a lot of them sat in, with the chanter, where the choir is, and now the church is sounding full. Everybody's singing, everybody's worshiping together. It's so beautiful. It was so beautiful and so full that the priest forgot how cold it was. The priest forgot how lonely it was because in the beginning it was just him and the chanter. And when he comes around in the procession, right? When we do Ninma uh, Dawe and he comes around the procession, he senses the congregation. He sees that the congregation very full, very surprising, right? Uh, on a day that's negative 10 degrees. Surprising to see a church that is this full. He sees bishops, he sees priests, he sees monks, he sees nuns, he sees lay people. And because he's a priest and he sees these bishops, when it's time for him to receive Kurvana, he looks to the bishop, you know, asking him to come receive first. And the bishop tells him, you go, you go receive Kurvana first. So he goes. And he comes outside to give Kurbana to everybody. And everybody looked very familiar. And what he realized is that everybody in the church that filled the church that morning of Kurbana was somebody who passed away that he knew. It was a church filled with the saints, with the holy ones who were set apart 
Even the bishops that he saw in the altar, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, night, people who, who we know about, people who we read about. And this is the reality of our worship. This is the reality of when we draw near to God. It comes back down to this community comes down to a communal worship. We are never, even when we're in our rooms praying alone, we're not alone. We're praying with the saints. We're asking them to intercede for us because they are directly close to God. This right here is the physical manifestation of what happens every Sunday. What ha happens every prayer, whether it's in the church, outside of the church, in our homes, before we go to sleep. This is what it looks like to all the saints who are there who are praying for us, who are praying with us, who are side by side with us. We see, just as I would ask somebody to pray for me, we ask the saints to pray for us because they're alive in Christ. They're not dead. They're people, they're individuals just like you and I. They had the opportunity just like you and I are given to immerse our lives in, in, the, in the church, to immerse our lives with the sacraments, the prayer life, the scripture reading. The only difference is that they choose to do it. Sometimes we don't. That's the only difference. And so if they choose to do it, and we know they're, they're individuals who chose to do it, we should go to them and ask them to pray for us. That by their prayers, we may be healed. That by their prayers, we may pass this test. By their prayers, we may get this job. Beloved of the Lord, the saints are our friends. They are people just like you and I who live the life of Christ. They are role models for each and every single one of us. May their intercessions, may all of the saints' intercessions be a stronghold for us. And by their prayers, may our Lord grant us mercy. May our Lord grant us our petitions, our prayers, our requests, may he answer them by their prayers. All for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and ever unto the ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. There was a question that was asked. I'm going to just say it out loud. Uh, the question is,